Welcome to 12 Old Field. We are interviewing Tony O'Gorman. Yes, uh, my name is Tony O'Gorman. I was born and reared in Fona. I was born in my grandfather's house, uh, Pat Graney, uh, where Della Graney now lives. I had no brother or sister, but I had lots of cousins and friends, and I had a wonderful childhood. Um, I have great memories of the farm. It was a small farm like most farms, but the grainies worked very hard. Everyone in the area worked very hard. And I suppose they were blessed in having very good land, even though the farms were small. I loved the farm and I loved everything about the land. And to this day, my roots are in the land and that's why I like returning to Fohana so often. I was never really away from Fohana. Uh, the environment and the area where I lived, uh, Johnston's was the biggest farm around. And Jimmy Johnston apparently was a very good farmer. He was very well respected and he set, it, he set the bar for other farmers in the area. 10 or 12 people at least worked on that farm and I, I think they were very devoted farmers or farm workers. The Maddens particularly I remember. I remember clearly and it's my abiding memory of the noise of the farm, particularly the mowing machines. And when Jim Madden started the mowing machines in the big fields, you knew that summer had arrived. The mowing machine to me had a different sound to any other machine I ever heard since. There was a whine all of its own. It was unique and it sent this searing sound through all the neighbouring areas. It may have been the field in which Johnston's were cutting. There were big fields and uh, he often had two mowing machines and two teams of horses. And this was a big operation. While one man or two maybe sharpened the blades, a tricky job and a skillful job. <clears throat> and the machines went round and round the perimeter of the field, narrowing the ryegrass, while the wildlife ran for their lives from the machines but then they found that there was a machine at the other end and they were surrounded and the poor things their their cover was minimized as the machines surrounded them and they've often seen Jim Madden get off the machine and who shout a, a bewildered hare or a young bird or a corn crate to safety and then the, the, the meadow would be finished. Uh, there was something heavenly about the sound of this machine. And you could recognize whether the hay was good or bad, or whether the machine, whether the blades were sharp or otherwise, by the noise they sent out. If they weren't sharp, it was very hard on the horses. And uh, Jim Madden loved his horses. He loved all animals, Jim did. And I think both man and beast loved Jim. It is said that Jim, on his return journey from Knock one time, spotted a, a nice black ass foal somewhere near my law. He bought the ass and walked it home. And if Jim could have carried the ass on his shoulders, he'd spare him the walk. Are there any other sounds of the countryside you can remember? Yeah, the thrashing machine. The thrashing machine was something special to children. Every autumn when the cordon was in the haggard, the thrasher and the thrashing machine arrived. And this was a major operation. The machines were very heavy, particularly the steam engine pure solid steam, 
to shift them was a major operation and it took horses and men pushing and shoving to get it into place. And then the colourful thrasher. All the thrashers seemed to be very colourful. And uh, when the belt was put on and the drums started, you'd see the mehel gathering with pitchforks from every house in the neighbourhood. We loved this as children because there were rats and there was mice and there were dogs and there was a huge excitement in the farmyard, whether it was a big farmyard or a small one, with the material. There were huge there was huge excitement and all the neighbours seemed to be in good form for this particular operation. Um, the machine made a dreadful noise and you'd hear it for miles. Indeed, that was the signal for the neighbours to come. Nobody had to tell them. They could hear it easily in the distance. And then, after the job was done, it was a major one, by the, by the, the sheaves of corn were pitched in onto the deck of the thresher, and the man in charge fed them into the drum. And by some miraculous in, intervention, the machine was able to shake the ears of corn out of the pods, separate them from the straw, send the straw out in one direction, the chaff out is shoot in another direction, and surprise, surprise, bagfuls of beautiful golden, golden corn out the, the rear of the machine. I was intrigued, everyone was intrigued with the threshing machine. But usually, we were more intrigued with the meal that followed because it was much like the well not as as grand as the stations of the cross but every householder or every woman would like to send the neighbours home with fed at least and there was usually on offer white bread from tribals in Haskra which normally wouldn't be on offer but it was there that day. And not alone that, there'd be a nice selection of jam. And on that particular day, we, uh, we as kids got more than we would normally. Because of the big crowd at the table, most ladies, they, were, they might be stuck for the odd jam, cup or saucer. And it was nothing unusual, or it was no shame to go to the neighbours for a small set an extra set of plates and of cups and that was well understood and but of course one particular treasure owner from Ahasra he claimed that there was only one set of death in Lovell. That may not have been the truth but uh, I'm sure it wasn't the truth. But there's also a story told that this particular householder was anxious to go to push the boat out a little and put on a little more than usual. She decided to have a, a rib of beef and some vegetables. And uh, she was very pleased with her performance. And the men, of course, were very pleased. And towards the end of the meal, she suggested, um, or she asked, uh, does anybody else want more now? And all the, all the men are near, said, um, I oh, know we're Grand Mary, we're, we're lovely now, we're, we're fine. But there was one particular guy, Tom, who was a casual labourer in the house, and uh, did casual labour there, and he knew Mary better than most, and he says, that was my chance, and he says, Mary, I'll have a bit of meat. And she would angle over towards Tom, and s with sleight of hand push a little spoon of, or a large spoon of turnip out on his plate and move on. Is everybody happy with that? And they'd all agree. A little bit later she might come back and say, well, anybody want more? And he again, Tom again, would say, I'll have a bit of meat, Mary. And eventually Mary said to him, and it happened the third time, she says, well, if you eat any more meat, Tom, the cow will low inside in you. And he said, well, it won't be for the want of turnips, Mary. 